Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Voice of Adoptees. I am your host, David. Today, I'm here with Lori. She is a business owner, an author, an adoptee, and an adoptive parent. Welcome, Lori. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Really appreciate it. Uh, will you please tell our listeners about yourself, where you're from, where you're adopted from, and a fun fact about you? Ah, happy to. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so I'm a domestic uh, baby scoop era adoptee. I was uh, roughly six weeks old um, in a Catholic charities facility. I can only guess that is a fact, but uh, I was born in Salt Lake City, Utah. My adoptive parents were older, uh, unable to conceive, and uh, the story they told me was very lovely that of course my my birth parents were you know in college and just unable to care for me but in love and all of that and of course we later find out that none of that's true <laughs> but made for a, a lovely narrative until i was in my 20s um they moved immediately to the bay area my dad was in in sales and uh and had been transferred right away so i didn't spend any time in utah except for that first six weeks um so had a very lovely upbringing. My parents were amazing people. They've both since passed. My mom died when I was 16. So that was hard. And my dad lived a long life uh, to 91. So um, always felt loved wow. and supported. I was raised an only child and, you know, they were older. So they had, you know, some disposable income. So I was, you know, we had little vacations I mean, nothing extravagant, but I, I've, lived a, a nice uh, life. I grew up in mostly in Connecticut. We moved eventually uh, to the East Coast. Um, and that's where my dad stayed. Um, I did not know I was adopted until I was eight. Um, that was a shock to me. And I remember that moment that day, it was a Saturday, it's in the book that I wrote. Um, my, my, my track, my song. Um, it was one of those, you know, up, turn my world upside down moments like, what? What do you mean I'm adopted? My mom did not want to tell me. Um, my dad, I guess, as the story somewhat got told, because then, of course, we never talked about it again. <laughs> um, or yeah. very rarely. Yeah. It's goofy and uncomfortable. So you just accepted it. And we're grateful and all that, you know, now that I know that that's all very common. Um <clears throat> But the, I was very inquisitive. So <clears throat> um, as, a, as a child, as it turns out, I'm very curious as an adult. But I'm like, so, Mom, why are there no pictures of me until I'm like six weeks old? Mom, how come there's no pictures of you when you're pregnant? Mom, how come, you know, because all my friends are like, oh, here's my baby picture. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like much bigger. <laughs> so I think that all of that uh, led them to say, oh, we better tell her because we're going to run out of answers. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just remember that we all sat down. It was a Saturday night. I, you know, I was just devastated. Uh, so that probably was the first real identity obliteration that, you know, I experienced as an adoptee and had no construct to fall on that I was going through adoption trauma, which of course, decades later, uh, with the advent and discovery of the brilliant, the primal wound, made all the sense in the world, but that was just a year ago that I, you know, became uh, aware of, of this and of adoption trauma. So of course I dove, you know, feet first or head first into learning all I could uh, about that. And then it just made so much sense, um, you know, all these times in my life where, you know, that was happening. As, as far as my um, unfolding of the adoption story I, I i was very happy i had great parents so you know maybe there was probably some curiosity you know as i've read adoptees fantasize about their families and that kind of thing um, my fantasy was that my dad was actually my dad because i kind of looked like him we were both double jointed we had you know had similar features you know i, I fit right into mm -hmm. my family like, no one ever questioned it you know um, and Heffron's, you don't look adopted. I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, I can relate to her and, and her <laughs> upbringing as well. So it was very similar. Um, 
you know, but I also dreamed I had lots of uh, siblings. So, you know, like the Partridge family back in my day was a big deal. Well, I, of course, was a member of that family. And then there was eight is enough. And I was always attracted to friends who had large families, you know, and I was so uh, fascinated with genetics, which of course that term wasn't even necessarily used at the time, but that they all looked alike, you know, like there's certain families that you went to school with that they all looked alike and you're like, oh yeah, you must be an, an Irwin or a Cassane or whatever. Cause they all just had such similarity. So that I was always fascinated with like, oh, what would it be like to look like somebody? Right. I mean, I know we, we all go through that. Um, so at fast forward into my twenties, I started adulting and, um, getting, setting up doctors and that kind of thing. And then the whole narrative of, so what's your medical history? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. My mother died of a heart attack, but no biology there. So, so I said, okay, well, I was a little curious and decided to try to find out something about my, um, my origins. Um, so I wrote to Catholic charities in Salt Lake. They sent some tiny little paragraph from the social worker that looked like the type font of the sixties. Um, not a whole lot there. What was uh, shared was that uh, the birth mother was 19. She wanted to keep me, but her mother was basically like, you know, hell no. <laughs> and <laughs> it was forced to, yeah. a, a little alliteration there, uh, and was pretty much forced to, to give me up. So I'm quite certain that that was a hugely traumatic experience for her. Um, and though, and I later ended up getting connected to her, uh, through ancestry. Um, and that was in about 2017. Um, but let me back up a little bit. So I did, uh, again, as I mentioned, reached out, um, the birth father didn't know about me, which, um, was news because, you know, my lovely, you know, Pollyanna story, my parents told me is that they were married and in college and, but no, the birth father did not know about me. He was, uh, supposedly 20 and in the service of some sort. Um, and the, and the birth grandmother, maternal grandmother did not approve. So that was all that was written there. So I kind of let that go. It's like, well, he didn't know about me. I'll never know about him. So it goes. Um, but I was always curious if I had siblings cause I was raised an only child and, you know, I always wanted a brother or something. And, um, so that was certainly curious, you know, if my birth mother was indeed 19 when she had me, then the likelihood that maybe she had other children possibly. Um, so I kind of let that go a little bit and fast forward, you know, in my own journey, I tried to have children and wasn't able to. And my husband at the time was like, we should adopt, we should adopt. And I'm like, no, oh, I was not for it. I did not think that was a good idea. I didn't know why, um, but I just, I, I really was resisting. I'm also very spiritual. So I, I believe in signs and, uh, and angels and all that. And I was, had a barrage of signs that I needed to be thinking about adoption. You know, adopt the highway signs were showing up where I never saw them before. Everybody's like, oh, I'm not a puppy. oh. Uh, you know, and then finally my roommate from college who, uh, I adore, and we would talk to each other on, on our commute said, Oh, you know, one of our classmates just adopted. And I, I was 42 at this point in time. And I'm like, that's crazy. Well, then I realized, all right, I'm supposed to adopt. My mom was uh, 43 when she adopted me. And I was 43 when I got Kate and I named her after my mom. And five months after I finally said, yeah, I should adopt. She was we got the call and um, her birth mom had some special needs challenges and, and really was unable to care for her. Didn't even know she was pregnant actually. So yeah, we do feel of course blessed that we found each other. We have a great relationship. In fact, uh, she and I both went to untangling your roots in Denver this last year. She's 17 now. And I asked her, do you want to go and we can learn together and, and it was really quite a special experience for, for us. So, um, I started to then 
be curious about ancestry and all the DNA things were can't even remember the name of the first one I did because I was curious about her her heritage as well because I wanted to honor if there was you know some you know uh cultural heritage that would be wonderful for her to be embracing so that was a nice clue it turns out she is um, half indigenous so um from a, a, a tribe in uh, Chile so I've tried over the years I could have done a better job but um we talk about it and she she knows and has some some pride about that um yeah so then I met another I started all of a sudden meeting adoptees and this is about five years ago uh and I ran into this woman Sharon um she turns out she was adopted she was a neighbor I had no idea we ended up chatting about it I'm like this is an amazing story and that was the epiphany that I I should write <laughs> book about all these stories so adoption songs was born then um people cho choose a song that resonates with their journey and their story and that's the title of their their chapter so that's why adoption songs but it's heartwarming and heartbreaking narratives from the many sides of adoption so we've got adoptees adopted parents we've got you know dna uh, discovery birth uh, or um siblings so we tried to capture some of the constellation, I wasn't able to secure uh, a birth mom, um, although I did end up chatting with um, a birth mom of one of the adoptees that's in the story. And she shared a lot about her trauma and, you know, the girls who went away, you know, Ann Fessler. I mean, that was, that was absolutely her experience. And, you know, so just learning so much about the complexity of the constellation and what people go through. And so I did end up finding birth father family, which was a shock because of course the birth father, you know, didn't know about me. And that, that part was true. Um, he was not 19 or 20, he was 35 and had a family. So not sure that that story's probably, he was, he was dead by the time I, I found the family, but a cousin, first cousin is the one who figured it out. Her mom, his mom, um, Aunt Barb, she's uh, featured in in my in my track. Um, I, I I have an Aunt Barb too. <laughs> oh, do you? That's great. But yeah. She was hilarious, and she she passed a couple of years after I found her. But we talked a lot. She wrote me this beautiful poem that I I have in the book, and so that was really really cool. I'm, I'm somewhat in touch with the with my cousin who figured it all out. But you know, we went down and and met met that part of the family. I did find a half sister that we share birth father. He relinquished her, uh, at birth. Um, and we were in reunion for about five years. And then I went through a lot. I went through a divorce and selling my home and a lot of upheaval. And, and I think that was, I was a little much for her probably. So, um, she was very brave and said that she, couldn't be in relationship with me anymore. So I had to respect that that was her boundaries and, you know, I wish her well. Uh, but yeah, that was sad because I was excited to have an older sister and, and, and have some family, but I, I treasure that I do have that experience and I did get to, I did get to connect with someone who did look like me and it's okay. You know, everybody's got their story. The birth mother. Yeah. Did she give a, did she give like a did she give a reason why it was too much or was it just too emotional for her to keep a relationship? Um I I think because well, I'm very extroverted and I overshare and she she was much more quiet and reserved and I I just think I was a little too much energy for her and that's fair, you know. Well, um no, uh, you were, you t you said that um, you know you didn't find out that you were adopted until eight years old, and I guess my question is why do you think? Uh, I mean, do you know why your parents kept that information for eight years? Did they ever justify their reasoning, or do you do you know why? I guess. Yeah, my mom adored me. I mean, we would joke around and, you know, escalate how much we loved one another and it would end with I idolize you was her to me. 
she wanted me to be hers. She just, she loved me so much. And I get that because I feel the same with, with Kate. So I understand that, that love and, and she, back in the, I guess it'd be the seventies by the time they told me, um, you know, adoption wasn't talked about. I mean, it was on the down low for sure. And I didn't know anybody else adopted and, and we had moved so that, you know, we were in an area where we didn't know anybody. We didn't have any family around. So there wasn't any potential family to be like, oops, slipped out. Um, so I think, you know, their secret was safe. Um, but again, with my curiosity, my mother was, and father chronicled everything. They had a video camera. I mean, every, every moment of my life, but it didn't start until six weeks after I was born. So, you know, it's, oh, well, we just didn't have a camera yet. Okay. You know, so, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She wanted me to be hers and she didn't want me to ever feel bad about it, you know, and of course it backfired and then I didn't trust her. And then I found out a few years later that she lied about her age. She was actually, she did, said she was born the same year as my dad. You know, she was March, my dad was July. Well, it turns out she was nine years older than my dad. And I discovered that visiting a grandfather and he had a family Bible with all the, you know, children and their birth dates. I'm like, why would they have the wrong birthday in the Bible, mom? <laughs> Oops. So bless her heart, kind, wonderful woman, but she had her own trauma as we all, we all do, um, that she was overcoming. She was the youngest of four, grew up in the depression. Her father was a bootlegger, you know, I mean, it was tough times. Um, and she didn't want me ever to both of them. They were both depression era. They wanted me to have the best of everything, you know, and, and I appreciate that because I, I was given opportunities they didn't have. Um, I wasn't spoiled yeah. in, in a materialistic way necessarily, but I was spoiled in love and acceptance, uh, which I think served me well. I did grow up, you know, confident in my own way, at least on the outside. And, but there was always, I definitely had the stuff inside that I didn't belong and I didn't fit in. And, you know, I was fairly active and involved in high school, but I floated around to groups because I just never felt like I connected with anybody. And I, you know, I thought that was weird, but I, you know, I didn't have, and I didn't have the construct of, of belonging and adoption trauma. I mean, for sure, I was taken from my birth mother and given to perfect strangers. You know, I was the typical, you know, birth adoptee and that, that you know, so it helped. I mean, that was hugely helpful. I'm also an executive coach. So I've been doing a lot of, of inward work, uh, self-awareness, self-management, lots of, lots of self-discovery anyway, throughout my, my life and my career. Um, so I'm glad I had all of that to support me uh, as I did discover what was the crux of all of these weird feelings I never could identify. But at least I had some techniques uh, and strategies to keep above the waterline because, you know, I, I, of course, I'm very active now learning and meeting people on Insta. And, you know, there's a lot of very angry adoptees out there and I appreciate yeah. and empathize. Yeah with what they've learned. And, and I, and there's also adoptees out there that have had horrible experiences. In fact, I had one comment on a post I did on TikTok that, you know, her father, her, her uh, adoptive father is a pedophile. And I'm like, oh, it, I mean, what do you, th there's no excuse for that. I, I, right? I, I've learned throughout the uh, different social platforms. I'd say TikTok is the one that has the most, negative opinions that I think I've come across and it's unfortunate, but you know, I mean, you said it, you're, you know, just what you said. I mean, adoption, there are some people who have positive stories and there are some people who have, you know, negative stories, but you horrible, have to respect their, stories. uh, yeah. And you know, you, you can't Live experience matters. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Their experience is equally as important as anyone else's. So it's so just a shame to hear it. But. It's 
Well, yeah. and never mind international adoptions. I mean, I've heard horror stories. I'm sure you have too. And God, I hope you weren't a victim of one of them. But yeah, so that that I, I touch on that a little bit. One of the the tracks, a uh, friend of mine adopted internationally and wasn't good what they found out. Yeah. So I, I think where I'm I'm hoping in all of this uh, that with the background that I do have in really helping and supporting people to create a better future for themselves, that I can take that and how I used it in in a corporate setting. And you know, of course, I'm no therapist, so I'm never going to be qualified to be one. But you know, I think if people are really ready to you know get out of that fog and you know create that new playlist for their life and and, and want to stay above that waterline because it's so easy to sink down into dark, deep depression and who am I? No one loves me. You know, I, I kind of refuse to let myself go there. I let myself go dip down a little because I, re- I have really no family now. I have some step family who have been trying to make me still feel a part of a part of their center of family. But truly, I am an outsider and you know, they're kind enough. And so I think a lot of us struggle with that, you know, and and I think those who were able to physically give birth and have family and, you know, get that DNA connection, because that's really strong. I mean, that's your tribe. Yeah. Um, Do you ever, um, do you ever feel like uh, you mentioned that you, you know, as an outsider, do you think that, um, adoption is like the, I guess, sole reason that you feel like an outsider? Or do you think that it's the way you were raised or who you surround yourself with? Um, I'm just curious because, you know, I mean, I guess most adoptees, you know, we are outsiders in a lot of ways because we, you know, we didn't come from that family. We got adopted into that family. But, you know, the, the way that your race and everything can really have a large impact on your experience and everything. So I'm just curious of like, you know, curious what your opinions are about that. Yeah. And I, and I'm sure it's another complex question, right? I mean, like I said, my, I didn't have other, my, my mother dying was trauma for sure. Cause then, and I didn't realize this, but then I lost two mothers. I lost my birth mother and then I lost my adoptive mother by the time I'm 16 and then truly I was on my own. I mean, my dad was basically, he remarried right away and we went off to college and there was never an opportunity to connect that family. And he's like, yeah. go, go live your life, work, do your career. I'm proud of you. You're awesome. You can do this. So and back in the eighties, yeah. I mean, you just went and <laughs> got a job and started your own family. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, of course, of course, your life ex- life experiences are are going to um, create that lack of belonging or identity, and and then of course, you know, you hear this all the time from people that are not adopted that you know everybody's got trauma. Of course, that's true, and I think we've got a very different, unique condition that's in in our tissues that we didn't ask for, you know, I mean, there's thank goodness so much evidence that says that of course, nonverbal infants can recognize that they're not with their birth moms and they're looking around going, what, where am I? What's going on? So you're in fight or flight. You've got cortisol shooting through your body from, from the beginning, Never mind the cortisol, the birth mother was probably infusing into the fetus through her, traumatic, you know, pregnancy, especially if, you know, the right. baby soup era, you know, the shame, all of that. Um, you know, you mentioned before we were talking about the culture in, in Russia and the shame and it, yep. ba- it innocent yeah. babies should not have to be bathing in shame. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's, they, they shouldn't be, they, you know, we definitely shouldn't be labeled as the victims because we are just a result of what happened yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and so many people, cause I'm, I'm feeling called to help the mainstream see things a little differently. Cause I'm, I, I absolutely 
spectrum, right? You got the, oh, adoption's beautiful and lovely and, you know, you should be grateful. And thank you, Angela Tucker, for a great book entitled just that. And then there's the angry adoptees that are, you know, just killing it for reform, which I, I which I agree, there needs to be reform. Do I think abolishing adoption is going to solve it or that it's possible? I personally do not think that it, it's probably going to get abolished. Should it be, you know, should adoptive parents be well informed and should adoptees be getting therapy immediately? Absolutely. You know, and I don't know if that'll solve it all either, but, you know, I, I talk to adoptive parents where they're like, yeah, you know, my son, my daughter, you know, they're, they're, they were great. And then all of a sudden, you know, they got into their teen years or early twenties and this tumult, um, started I'm like, that's, that's that, that's, that's the trauma coming out. Yeah. You know, and you I've can't noticed, ignore that, um, right? So I, I just I hope like that I can help kind of that mainstream know that a lot it's a of different. Trauma. You know, we don't get birth certificates, we don't get history, yeah. we don't get, you know, the, the 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 verbal narrative of, you know, hundreds of years of your, you know, your background, and even though even if your background's bad, and you don't get along with your family, you're still biologically connected to them yeah i i just think i think at the bare minimum I'm at least you know at least we should be able to get medical history i mean the fact that some of us like i was talking to you before uh the, the interview this interview getting adopted to the u.s and having made up medical history i mean that's that's just kind of disgusting if you ask me like what what government would just allow that to just fake a bunch of stuff on i mean Come on, like I didn't even know my own like blood type until three years ago when I was in the hospital uh, for an injury. Like, I mean, the fact that you just don't know like basic human things, I feel is just. I think it's wrong. It's it's like criminal in my opinion. <laughs> well, it is, David. I mean, your your story. I had no idea that those you know practices were happening. So thank you for enlightening me to that. But talk about unethical. I mean, you're entering the world in an unethical environment with people who think that that's okay because they've been doing it all along. Well, this is how we move the babies out. Oh my gosh! Right. So yeah. Bless yeah. you for those beginnings yeah i mean yeah i it was always you know it's always been a pain because since i reconnect with my biological family before that every single doctor every you know i i i exam orthodontist dentist whatever whenever they ask you know what's your medic what's your family medical history you have to say i don't know <laughs> and that that's just you know it sucks. That's pretty much the only way to say it. Like you don't know. It's yeah. Just, and I, I didn't realize how I much it sucked until I started doing it with my daughter. Right. Cause it's like, Oh God, you have this too. We don't know. She's adopted. Well, what's your background? I don't know. I'm adopted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have, we have like generations of unknown here. So you know. yeah. Well, and interestingly, so, we did discover, cause I think like 23 and me was kind of, a cool um, test and that they had the 84, 86 disease states if you're genetically predisposed. So that was very helpful. I think technology yeah. is, you know, being a little useful when it comes to that. Now having all your DNA out for the world to find is scary, but too late. I'm already out there. Um, you know, but my daughter, so since her birth mom, you know, had some special needs issues, she didn't know she was pregnant. There was no prenatal care. Now she was teeny oh. tiny when she was born, but caught up and, and was really healthy. I mean, we were very, very lucky. Um, however, she does, she had these growing pains all the time. And I'm like, oh, they're just growing pains. You know, hips, joints, knees, ankles, you know, and I, I didn't give it a lot of thought. And, you know, I after a while it would go away and she'd stop complaining about it. And then of course I'm busy and distracted. Well, turns out this past year, finally, I'm like, oh, all right, well, go take her to the, to the orthopod and we'll find out. 
Well, he came up with a fabulous theory that no one, and it made total sense. He's like, well, if there's no prenatal care, she probably had um, issues with her cartilage, you know, being fully formed and developed. So, and I'm like, oh, that, that makes total sense. Um, not a lot to do about it other than exercises and, you know, but that she's probably going to have, you know, some, some challenges over time with, with that. But yeah, that, that's an interesting thing that I guess we kind of knew, but you know, that does have that with those health impacts. Right. Uh, do you think that being an adopted parent now, you think that helped and, so, because you, uh, you know, first off you were adoptee. So do you think that helped in terms of when you adopted a child connect, uh, in some ways that others, I guess, couldn't just because you know what it's like to be an adoptee. So did that have any effect with, them, um, uh, your child when you adopted them? So I think certainly I can only speak for, for my experience in that it's sure, I, I, there were things about my adoption that I wanted to make sure were better for, for her, which number one yeah. was knowing you're adopted. <laughs> um, <laughs> so she just yeah. know all her life. I was lucky enough Not gonna to wait eight years. Yeah. <laughs> and I was lucky enough to have a picture of her birth mom giving her to me. So she actually can see what her birth mom looked like. And and we go through that book. Well, not now that she's 17, but we'd go through that book every birthday and kind of honor that heritage and, you know, talk about her being a Mapuche and all of that. So I, I think that, yes, then that did help me at least for her. So there was no big giant surprise. I also knew a little bit about the birth father. Um, you know, she has a half brother from a previous pregnancy that also was given up for adoption so I, I was trying to figure out what's the age appropriate time to tell her these things. Cause I didn't, I didn't want to wait till she's 21. And then you're like, what? I have a half brother. Why don't you tell me? So <laughs> I, I probably maybe told her a little too soon, but we're very, very close. We talk about everything. We're, you know, we're very, very connected. You know, I, I think she would say the same, but I, I won't speak for her. Um, so I think I made the right call and just being really transparent um, as much as I could. And then, of course, as I started to learn the primal wound and all of that, I said, hey, I'm, I'm learning some things. Do, you know, you let me know how much you want to know. And if it's too much, then just tell me. And back when we went to, the, you know, untangling our, our roots out in Denver, she was all in that first day. And then she was so exhausted. I mean, we all work. It's very emotional. And she goes, mom, can yeah. I take the day off today? I'm like, oh, gosh, of course you can. <laughs> you know? um, and everyone was just lovely. And she was clearly the youngest person out of the, you know, 300 people or whatever that was there. And, um, but it was nice because she, she made her own little connections and made, met some people and, um, and it was fabulous. That's awesome. Um, let's talk about your book a little bit. Um, besides being adopted, what were some other inspirations, uh, that wanted you to, I guess, author a book? Yeah. Well, I think <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to, um, have a great career at Procter and Gamble. <clears throat> so, you know, messaging and kind of packaging and putting things together was a skill that I had. So I, I had fun on the creative side of, of being able to um, tell these stories. And also my, my daughter, my stepdaughter is a trained editor and she wrote, you know, a lot of the stories I would interview, you know, just record it on zoom, <clears throat> get a transcript. And then Lexi was able to, to turn a lot of them into, you know, beautiful stories. And, um, nice. So I think being able to weave in, you know, one family was definitely a family project. Kate, and that's the book she helped with. She's an artist too, and uh, musical, and she's very musical. I was musical, so that the music theme was just obvious to us. And then I don't know if you can see it, but here's our little bookmark. It's our playlist, and these are all the oh, that's so cool. Copies. And then their song that they chose. So we've got you know, I won't give up, Fire and Rain, Bohemian Rhapsody, 
that taking it to the streets. That's the one, you know, you don't know me, but I'm your brother. <laughs> Surprise. Um, <laughs> it's been there too. So, you know, I, I, I think that the healing universal power of music um, is something that um, it, it can be really helpful in people's healing journey. Um, so part of what's come out of this, and, and I don't know if it'll work, but we'll try is being able to offer, you know, adoptees who really want to accelerate their, their healing path, right? Because doing it alone sucks. Uh, and I think yeah. there's so many yeah. of us out there that want to be a resource and help one. And it helps us too. Every time I hear someone's story, just like you sharing with me this morning was beautiful um, and very helpful. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that the, I think my audience is kind of the mainstream. I don't think adoptees necessarily, although I think there's probably um, some acknowledgement and reading other people's stories and seeing, you know, what they went through. Um, you know, but I, I hope that I can open some eyes so that people aren't naive that it's all roses and sunshine because it's not right. You know, yeah, you know, my little line initially was, well, yeah, adoption can be beautiful, but there's more. It's a, yeah, it's a big topic that I feel people don't know how to talk about unless you are inside. And we even don't know how to talk about it half the time. So I, it's like, it's relatively new. I mean, I think the best way to put it is I, I, I interviewed someone a couple of weeks ago and um, he told me, you know, he was adopted from a different era where no one talked about adoption. You know, it was something that you just didn't have a conversation about. And now, you know, here we are after 2020 and it feels like all the, all the adults from the eighties, seventies, nineties era, they're all coming out now and finally acknowledging it and like really thinking about it because it's something that it's, it's who we are as people. And, but it's, it's, it's complicated in a way where only, I guess we understand and we're trying to learn from each other. And, and the best way to do that is to start a conversation. So, um, you, you authored a book and I, I wrote kind of a part one of my story as well. Um, I have it out there as well. Uh, kind of like a little about myself and my trip back to Russia and all that, but, um, I'm still working on my part two, but it's, it's just, it, it's even for me, it's hard to just, you know, write your thoughts down about what I think about adoption because it's just so it's, it's, it's like a daunting, it's a daunting topic. <laughs> and, uh, okay. you know, I always applaud people that write about it and yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and and there's just so many, you know, the, I'm going to say it wrong, but the Harath um, um, retreat group that, um, the, I guess there's, you know, different three, five, seven day retreats for adoptees. So at least there's resources now. Um, yeah. So now that yeah. the cat's out of the bag, so to speak. Um, yeah. Lots of people who want to help are, are available out there. You know, I mean, the, the folks from, um, adoption unfiltered, um, you know, Lori Holden and, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, just a, a host of really strong qualified, you know, experts that are out there really doing great work and your, your group included with this podcast that people can find their voice. Um, the, yeah, that, that, that the whole, yeah. That's Connect the whole, group. yeah, the, that's why I started it. I mean, the whole, the whole reason behind it was just to have a safe place for people to just tell their story. And, you know, I've, we've only been doing it for over a little, you know, a year and a couple months. And Aww. it's crazy because yeah. I've talked to, I've interviewed a lot of people who said after like an interview, like, wow, like it was the first time that they ever actually like sat down and thought about their adoption and talked about it. And it's crazy. Cause like, just, you know, it's something that we don't do, I guess every, you know, we don't, I mean, this is just me personally, you know, I, I don't obsess about it all the time, 
there are some people who unfortunately, you know, they, they did have a traumatic experience from adoption. So it's going to be on their mind a lot more, but I mean, it, the whole reason behind this podcast was just the, well, the name kind of says it all voice of adoptees, like just talk <laughs> and tell, tell us your story, whatever you want, you know, a non-judgmental space, just share what you want. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for doing that and providing that space for, for people it's really important and and people need to feel safe and i think that you know because we are unique um and we've had these experiences that a lot of people are like really what i don't, I don't see that no you know we, we can't really talk to you know, i've got lovely <laughs> friends who ignore me but they're they're never going to understand so these new adoptees right. i've met um, yeah. recently it's just so wonderful because we just have to look at each other and we're like, yeah, I get it. I, it's it's beautiful, right? <laughs> yeah. Our own yeah. Language that we yep. instantly can feel one another. It's pretty powerful. Yeah. It's, it's hard when we, yeah, experience things like, you know, when, you know, if, I, if some, you know, for example, my biological mother calls me and it irritates me and I want to vent to someone about it. And they just look at me and they have no idea. Like, they're like, okay, well that, you know, that sucks. But you talk to someone who's adopted, they're, they're like, oh yeah, you know, I get it. <laughs> well, and she had her own trauma that, and you, right. who knows, my God, I can't even imagine what it's like to be a woman who's given up their child in Russia. That cannot be a, a, a good day for her. No, no, yeah. no. Um, no, definitely not. Um, so my final question for you is, and this is a big one, um, what piece of advice can you leave for our listeners and for the adoption community? What piece of advice can you leave from your experiences? What I'm encouraged about is that the um, therapeutic community is now recognizing that adoption trauma informed is a whole separate um, field of study. Uh, I think we're going to start seeing far more therapists out there available that are adoption trauma informed. Trauma informed is helpful, but adoption trauma informed whole special subset uh, subspecialty. Uh, so I would just highly recommend that we go get some therapy from an adoption trauma informed therapist. Um, because there's no reason to be alone. You know, once you finally do get out of that fog of, you know, fear and obligation and guilt and um, oh, it's hard. You don't want to be just left without um, coping skills with all of that emotion and, and confusion. So having someone that really is trained um, and then finding ways to, it's all down to the neuroscience. I truly believe that we can, you know, our, our brains believe what we tell it. And if we're like, oh, I'm, I'm a very sad adoptee, then we're going to be a very sad adoptee. If we're like, I'm a powerful adoptee, yeah. going to get out there and kick ass and help people and, and do something good as a result of this, your brain's going to believe that too. So, you, you know, as far as um, habit making and habit breaking. You can't stop a bad habit. You have to create a new one. So you can't stop feeling bad about being adopted. You have to start finding that gold there. So a couple of nuggets of advice. That that's that was beautiful. That was really good, really good wisdom and advice. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that you you said it perfectly. <laughs> uh, Lori, thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me. And thanks for letting me. About... Yes, you're fabulous. Oh, of course, I'm a big fan. And uh, you know, let me know how I can support you and the work you're doing because it's really important. Of course, no, absolutely. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, welcome you back anytime you want. Um, you want to tell us where we can uh, get your book and order your book? Yep. So um, Amazon has it. We're in still in that eight week pre-sale period, but on July 9th, it will get shipped. So um, it's right around the corner. In fact, that's my birthday. I figured that'd be a clever day to birth my book is on my birthday. So uh, 
I'm big into numbers and connectivity. So um, it's also available. Any of your favorite booksellers, Book Baby is um, the publisher and they have their own book selling mechanism. You can actually get it any day because they've been having it all along. But, and I would appreciate if anybody feels they know someone that could benefit from learning about these different stories. We've got 20 different narratives um, from a variety of lenses. Then, uh, yeah, we just really want to help help people, you know. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I look forward to reading it. I'm definitely going to get a copy myself. Well, you I'll know, send it, you one. Just give me an address. Sure. I, I would love a signed copy. Absolutely. And I'll, and I'll return the favor and send you a signed copy as well. Yeah. Good. Deal. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. Thank well, you. Lori, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And thank you to all of our listeners out there. Uh, for those who want to hear Lori's story, please visit your podcast platform on our website, voiceofadoptees.com. If you or someone you know is adopted, you can schedule an interview to be featured on our show. Don't forget to like, subscribe, rate, and share this episode to spread the voice of adoptees and check out and subscribe to our new Patreon page. On behalf of all of us, we thank you for listening. We will see you next week. Voice of Adoptees, who am I?